This is Quadrophenia, a musical film based on a rock opera from 1979. It takes place in London, England in 1965. The protagonist is a teenager named Jimmy. He's got a pretty hard life, it seems. He comes from an abusive working class family. He's working a dead end job that he hates and where he's disrespected at. But he, he loves his bike, he loves his clothes, his friends, his music, and speed. And uh, all of this adds up to the mod subculture. The mods had this strangely clean cut look. They wore like suits and ties. They rode Vespa scooters. They listened to a mix of soul music and old R&B and rock and roll, which was still relatively new at the time. Meanwhile, the rockers wore a lot of black, a lot of leather. They rode motorcycles. They listened to a lot of rock, as the name would imply. They also didn't actually have spikes and paint and shit on their jackets. That was the punks later on, but um, I have a pretty limited wardrobe to work with in these video productions that I'm doing in my apartment during the global pandemic. So this is what I got to work with. So you have these two groups of young people that seem to have pretty much everything in common except their clothes and their uh, preferred means of transportation and some of the music they listen to. But apparently these few differences meant a lot because there were a few huge riots where hundreds of them fought each other at the beach. And Quadrophenia is a dramatization of those mods and rockers conflicts. So early on, Jimmy runs into an old friend who's a rocker now, so they have a pretty awkward conversation about that. We see some mod versus rocker violence from pretty early on in the film. There's parties, there's lots of drugs, especially speed. The mods love their speed and they'd stay up all night dancing to early rock and roll and Motown music. And by about halfway through the film, we see the drug use start to really catch up with young Jimmy. And meanwhile, he starts to question whether the community he's found around being a mod is uh, actually a, a community that really does support him. I won't spoil this one entirely because I don't have to spoil this one, but I'll just say that it's, it's not a movie that you watch because it's like a masterpiece of storytelling or film. It's This one's really about the, the music and the clothes and the bikes. Or you could also watch it for its relevance to uh, urban social research, which is the most fun reason to watch movies ever. It's a textbook case, it, almost literally a textbook case, more like an important volume case in uh, the research on urban youth subcultures. Which might seem like a light or a trendy topic. I mean, I've been having fun with costume changes and stuff, music, fashion, partying, but the literature on youth subcultures gets into all the tough topics that social scientists specialize in. Race, ethnicity, gender, uh, class, they're all especially relevant here. Subcultures are how youth in cities express these parts of their identity and how they find community in a hostile environment or even find family when they previously didn't really have family. But youth subcultures are also potentially dangerous and unpredictable. Sometimes they degenerate into violent extremism. If you've watched my channel before, you might recognize some of the stuff that I say in this video because, uh, well, sometimes professors reuse content from class to class. We all do it. Sorry, other professors for snitching on us. We all do it sometimes, especially during a global pandemic. So my apologies if some of this is a bit of a rerun for you, but the video is being made for people that haven't necessarily heard this stuff yet. Subcultures are also a very urban topic. Of course, there's people in, you know, rural areas or small towns who are interested in subcultures, but for the most part, they seem to happen and grow in cities. And a lot of the research on subculture has focused on it as a kind of feature of urban life. And I think George Simmel, who I've cited a couple of times so far in this series, he can help us understand this. As I said in the past, one of Simmel's main points was that living in a city of hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, can make you kind of cold and indifferent. You have to ignore most people around you to prevent burnout, and that's kind of depressing, I guess. But he also said that city life involves considerable personal freedom, much more so than rural life or life in a small-scale society. Nobody knows who you are or particularly cares about you, really which means you're free to do whatever you want as long as it's legal or not too far outside the bounds of what's normal. And you can form communities of your own choice in cities. And subcultures are one interesting example of that. Starting around the 1930s, but especially in the 50s, there was a lot of research done by sociologists on youth and how and why they differ from social norms. And you can see this in the titles of the books, like Becker's Outsider, Studies in the Sociology of Deviance, and Cohen's Delinquent Boys, The Culture of the Gang. Stanley Cohen was a sociologist who studied the, the mods and, and the rockers and how the media treated them. And this was in keeping with a major concern of sociology at the time, the idea of juvenile delinquency and how to explain it structurally. And what he came up with was the kind of youth violence that you see among the mods and rockers was, was like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Or as Cohen put it, 
Quote, our society as presently structured will continue to generate problems for some of its members, like working class adolescents, and then condemn whatever solution these groups find. Young people became mods and rockers and fought over it because there wasn't much else to do. It was an expression of pent up anger over living in a very rigid class system and a lifetime of being disrespected at work and at school for that matter. So it was a, a misguided sort of resistance, basically. The mods and the rockers knew they were unhappy with the way things were, but they didn't have any kind of political stance or analysis that might guide them towards fighting for social change. So instead they fought each other. And then the media and middle class society vilified them for doing that, which caused more anger and more resentment, which led to more riots. But the main takeaway from Cohen's study is the part about vilification, and this is where the idea of the moral panic comes in. The moral panic refers to the belief that a group of people is deviant and dangerous, so much so that they're a threat to society. It's usually based on false or exaggerated media coverage, and it becomes a panic when it becomes widespread, and usually people start to demand that that vilified group be criminalized. So moral panics are usually about one or more types of discrimination. The, the one around the mods and the rockers, Cohen said, was about classism. It looks like the media coverage of the mods and the rockers and the actual violence among them was like a, a chicken and egg kind of scenario, like which, which came first. Uh, apparently the two groups didn't really hate each other that much at first. According to one documentary anyway, the, the two groups didn't really hate each other all that much at first. So they interviewed some very senior mods and rockers about, you know, their, their youth many decades previous. And they talked about how in the very early days you could have mods and rockers in the same place at the same time and there was no problems. And how people would kind of switch back and forth between the subcultures based on who their friends were or who they were dating at the time, for example. And then at one of the national holidays in 1964, these riots always happen during national holidays with, you know, day off, no money, nothing to do, I guess. There was some violence and vandalism, but not as much as the media said there was. But the media coverage exaggerated it and played up the idea of a gang fight between rival crews. And uh, once they called it that, that's what it became, according to some analyses. And again, in the same BBC documentary I mentioned, there's a woman who alleges that the journalist had deliberately tried to stir up a fight at, at one point to have something to cover. Subcultures don't only spring up around, you know, music and fashion and drugs and parties. They also arise in, in like institutions at particular times for particular reasons. And one example of uh, research on this, Paul Willis, 1977, his book, Learning to Labor, How Working Class Kids Get Working Class Jobs. He did participant observation field work with working class teenage boys in, in England in part to understand why class mobility was so limited there. And he found that their experiences in school were central to that. Well, I'm sure a lot of this is still true to at least some significant extent, but basically school wasn't doing much for working class youth at that time in England. It was more about trying to teach them like middle class ways of, of acting and speaking. So kind of devaluing who these youth were, while at the same time not giving them any kind of meaningful opportunities or avenues to change where they're at in life. So what do kids do in this useless and frustrating situation? Well, they rebel. They rebel by misbehaving, by exaggerating their working classness, by being tough and just causing shit just to do it. And Willis's main point was that these youth had developed what he called a, a working class counter school culture. Kids acting up in school, working class kids acting up in school was like this uh, resistance that let them keep their pride and cope with boredom. But in the end, uh, Willis said that it, it exhibited an element of self-damnation in the taking on of subordinate roles in Western capitalism. This counter-school culture kind of sounds to me like a subculture, and this one was about a, a class-based response to a particular frustrating situation, one that was resistance in some ways, but also didn't really change or accomplish anything. Not that anyone should expect, you know, teenagers to have it all figured out and know how to transform the political economic system they live under, but the point still stands. All that was published a couple of years before This Is England takes place. This is a British film made in 2006, but it takes place in 1983, and it takes place during a, a turning point in the skinhead subculture. The skinheads are another example of a youth subculture that came about as a sort of reaction to the stigmatization of working class youth, and it's a very misunderstood one. To this day, many people think that skinhead means the same thing as neo-Nazi, and obviously I can see why, because going back to the late 1970s, 
There's been generations of neo-Nazis and other kinds of racists who call themselves skinheads. But the real original skinhead subculture appeared in the late 1960s and it had nothing to do with neo-Nazism. In the later years of the modern rockers that I was just talking about, around the same time, there were more families immigrating to England from the English-speaking Caribbean, especially Jamaica. Many of these families moved into working-class neighborhoods and the Caribbean youth brought their own youth subculture with them, the Rude Boys. The Rude Boys listened to reggae, they wore dark suits, they had short hair. So for example, here's Bob Marley and the Whalers in 1965, all dressed like Rude Boys. Uh, Bunny Whaler on the left, Bob Marley in the middle, Peter Tosh on the right. And so by around 1969, the skinhead emerged as a sort of like subcultural fusion of, of, of something like the mods and also this rude boy subculture that had just moved to England from Jamaica. Back then, like most working class kids, I used the only two things at my disposal to create my identity, music and clothes. And in those days, around these parts, it was all about skinhead. So the first skinheads were black and white working class youth who mostly listened to reggae music so sometimes reggae from that period of like 1969 to 1972 or so is still called skinhead reggae. As for the neo-Nazism, that didn't come in until later in the 1970s. By then the original skinheads had mostly grown up and grown out of it, it seems. Meanwhile, it was tough economic times and a lot of white British people were very angry and very worried about the future. So in comes the National Front, a neo-Nazi group. And they sort of appropriated the, the image of the skinhead while trying to erase the, the black roots of the subculture. And this became the new face of British racism. The media picked up on it and it spread across Europe and then North America through to the 1980s. Also since the 1980s, there's been different groups of anti-racist skinheads. So as one example, here's the Baldies of Minneapolis, Minnesota in the late 1980s. A, a multi-ethnic skinhead crew who basically got together to take a stand against neo-Nazis in their city. There's the Skinheads Against Racial Prejudice, a worldwide network that still exists. And there's groups of youth and also, well, old people who used to be youth but still are into the subculture who claim the skinhead thing and their politics range from far left to far right, anywhere in between. Meanwhile, as everybody watching this probably knows, in recent years there's been an upsurge in neo-Nazism and other kinds of white supremacist ideology. The alt-right, the white supremacists, other racist losers that have come out of the woodwork in recent years, they don't look subcultural so much anymore. They tend to try to blend in with what, whatever is normal in their time and place, I guess. And you don't really see as many Nazis claiming the skinhead label. Everything I just said about the skinheads by telling the story of uh, that influx of fascism into the subculture as it happened among one particular group of young skinheads in 1983. The protagonist is Sean, who's having a hard time in life. His father died in the Falklands War. His widowed mom doesn't have a lot of money. He's getting bullied in school. He basically carries himself like a grumpy old man, but he's 12 years old. And he finds something like a family early in the movie when he falls in with some older youth who are part of the, the late 70s, early 80s skinhead revival. There's no indication they have any interest in far-right politics or racism. One of them, Milky, is black. And then they're forced to choose sides when Combo gets out of jail and comes back on the scene. Combo's an older, former skinhead turned Nazi bonehead. He's been radicalized in prison and starts using slurs in Milky's presence and starts preaching National Front talking points. So young Sean, the protagonist, and a couple of other members of the crew fall for it basically. Meanwhile, Woody, the, the former leader and others want nothing to do with the racism, but I have to say I'm unimpressed with how they handle it. They clearly don't like it, but they don't make a clean and total break from Combo. And Milky is sort of caught in the middle of this. Later in the film, Combo gets high and starts acting friendly with Milky while, while a bunch of them are hanging out together, including young Sean. And as part of that conversation, Milky starts to get a bit nostalgic about his Jamaican upbringing, how tight-knit the community is, and in a fit of jealousy and, and racism, Combo then brutally attacks Milky. And in the end, that was enough to get Sean out of fascism and away from Combo. So the movie ends with him throwing the St. George's flag that Combo had given to him into the sea. We also learn at the end of the film that Milky is okay, and there's then sequels that follow the crew through to the 1990s. Up next we have Jenny Livingston's Paris is Burning, which has almost nothing in common with anything I've just said. It's a documentary, first of all, and it takes place in quite a different time and place, uh, the ball subculture in New York City in the mid to late 1980s. The ball is central to the social lives and the community of, of gay and transgender people of color at the time, particularly black and Latinx youth. 
and it was focused around a series of drag competitions. But there's much more to it than that as well. The ball is also, it's, it's family. These were very homophobic times. And so many of the ball goers had been outcast by their biological families because of their sexuality and gender identities. And the community around the ball provides them with the love and the nurturance that basically most straight people can count on receiving from their biological kin. So for example, Pepper LaBeja, one of the stars of the film, calls herself the, the mother of the House of LaBeja and refers to the regulars as her children. In an anthropological sense, it's about play. Uh, adults play too, play isn't just for kids. Play in this sense means stepping into a different frame or context and doing that consciously in a way that alludes to the real world, the non-play world, by transforming objects and roles and actions and, and relations from that, that real world into an exaggerated or satirical version of the real thing, which sounds kind of deep, but it's also fun, and that's a large part of the film. So for example, you see people transforming like objects from a non-play world, like, like military gear or briefcases or business suits, and kind of sexualizing and making fun of those things all at the same time. Or as the journalist Amru al Qadi puts it, wearing the costumes of the country that denounced them. Another good quote from the same journalist, uh, drag performers are to pop culture what Robin Hood is to the financial elite. So taking somewhat meaningless symbols and icons from the mainstream and injecting them with politics for the benefit of that community. That's especially the case with the realness competitions, where the, the intent is to create the most accurate representation possible of a particular kind of conservative straight person, basically, like a business executive or an Ivy League student. So why do adults play like this? It gives people a chance to reflect on their role in the real world. It's fun, it's also a stress reliever, and all of that is very sorely needed by participants in the ball. Most of the people in the ball are relatively young, people of color, poor or working class, with a variety of gender and sexual identities. Some of them are also currently unhoused. So they're among the most marginalized and disadvantaged people in American society, really. Uh, that's the case today, but it was especially the case in 1989. And to make some connections to my last cities of film video, all of this was located right in the middle of the revanchist city at the exact time that urban revanchism was a major political force. So the ball participants were all members of groups that revanchism targeted. So in this context, it's a precious opportunity to be oneself and also to reflect on one's role in society through play, through, through having fun and building community. It was also very competitive though, so it's not like it was all just love and support, um, but I guess the worst case scenario of the competitions was maybe getting gossiped about or not winning the competition or being made fun of for being tacky or something, but that's still quite a lot safer and more pleasant than the outside world for a lot of people. Paris is Burning is also a controversial film. The, the way it was initially received in 1991, for the most part, was that you know, finally someone had made this respectful, sympathetic representation of ballroom culture. It showed people telling their story on their own terms, it legitimated their subculture, and this was a good thing. The, the film was seen as an important resource in the fight against homophobia and gender discrimination, basically. But not everyone felt this way, even from the beginning. Some commentators were very critical about the, the politics of representation in this film. So as early as 1992, for example, Bell Hooks said the film was basically a, a sensational, one-sided, limited portrayal of the subculture made by a white filmmaker for a white audience who wasn't really connected to that subculture. And so as a result, it was basically voyeurism. And there were reports from very early on that some people who appeared in the film felt they had been betrayed. One of the main figures in the film is Pepper LaBeja, who told the New York Times in 1993, quote, I love the movie, I watch it more than often, and I don't agree that it exploits us, but I feel betrayed. When Jenny, the director Jenny Livingston, first came, we were at a ball in our fantasy, and she threw papers at us. We, we didn't read them because we wanted the attention. We love being filmed. Later, when she did the interviews, she gave us a couple hundred dollars, but she told us that when the film came out, we would be all right, that there would be more coming. But then the film came out and, and nothing. They all got rich and we got nothing. There's lots more details in the many articles you can read about this controversy, but the short version is Jenny Livingston denies getting rich from the film. As she once put it, quote, the truth is I live about the same as I did, except that I used to be chronically about three months late in paying the rent, and now I'm more or less on time. Some people who appeared in the film tried to sue, but those claims were all dropped. There's, there's no obligation to pay anyone you interview, and plus they had all signed releases anyway. But there was significant money at stake. The film cost 500000 to make, and it grossed over $4 million in theaters, which isn't much by movie standards in general, but for a, a documentary, that's a lot, especially for the early 90s. 
Not long after, Livingston did pay a total of 55000 out to 13 performers who appeared in the film with the amounts determined by how long they were on screen. So here's a bit of an epilogue, I guess. Uh, for the most part, youth subcultures are small and marginal. Few people outside of them really understand them or think much about them. But they show up in unpredictable places, like this Beyonce video from 2013. So these people in the flawless video are not just random extras. They're an actual anti-racist skinhead crew from Paris, France. I don't know the whole story behind the video, but it seems that someone involved thought that this anti-racist, multicultural skinhead crew fit the image of the song and the video, which uh, many people still see as like a modern day feminist anthem. I did not ever expect to see skinheads in a Beyonce video. So to tie some of this together, when young people in urban environments face alienation and exclusion, they find some kind of way of making connections and making their lives meaningful. Sometimes they do so in a way that involves taking a stand against racism and homophobia and other forms of oppression that impact upon their own lives and their communities. But youth subcultures are also unpredictable and they can be dangerous. Working class urban youth can also become the oppressor or become their own oppressor. And this can also just as easily involve violence, extremism, and hatred. The films I chose for this one might not seem to have much in common on the surface, but I think they both do a good job of showing how all this plays out for very different groups of young people in very different times and places. I'll be back in a couple of weeks with more cities and film. Thanks for watching.